It would be quite difficult to determine who exactly is the most important historical figure in Westeros. George R. R. Martin's work is vast and spans a lot of years and a lot of history, and I think there are a number of individuals who there could be pretty strong cases for. You can make a case for Aegon I, you can make a case for a number of the old lords from before his time, like uh, Lan the Clever, or the kings of House Gardner, or even some more recent kings, like Jaehaerys I, or even people uh, kind of more contemporary, like Aegon V. For my money, I think there's a set of nobles from a time that we will soon be familiar with in Westerosi history that are far and away the most important characters in the entirety of A Song of Ice and Fire history. I am talking, of course, about the subjects of today's video. I am talking about the generations of House Tully that George R.R. R. Martin decided to name after some Muppets. Some of you might think I'm crazy, and I am, but we're not going to talk about that right now. We're going to talk about Muppets. George R.R. R. Martin decided to name a few generations of House Tully after, I think, some Sesame Street characters and some Muppets. I think Oscar is Sesame Street. I'm sure I'll get comments on if that's correct or not. This comes from the time of House of the Dragon, and we do actually see some reference to one of these characters in the first season. Specifically in the sixth episode, uh, during the small council meeting of King Viserys, we hear reference to one Lord Grover Tully, the old Lord of Riverrun, who's dealing with some issues with the Brackens and the Blackwoods. We don't hear anything more from, about him from the rest of the season, other than some brief reference in the finale, in terms of Rhaenyra wanting to rally lords to her cause. But we will hear in season two, and we do hear later in Fire and Blood, about his grandson Elmo and Elmo's sons, Kermit and Oscar, all of which are named after a variety of puppets by George R. R. Martin. I'll go into who each of these characters are a bit later, but before I do that, I wanted to talk about why I think they're important to the story as a whole. They are pretty controversial. Some fans don't like them, such as Fantasy Haven, who I do expect you all to comment on his videos and make sure he knows how much the Muppet Tullys should be supported. But some people don't like the Muppet Tullys because they think it breaks immersion or it's too silly for what's supposed to be a serious story. But that is exactly why I love the Muppet Tullys so much. I think that a lot of the tone of A Song of Ice and Fire is caught up in Game of of Thrones. Game of Thrones is very self-serious. It's this dark fantasy story that must be all completely played straight all the time. The books are pretty different than that. There are a number of bright colors and bright characters, and I think the Muppet Tullys are an excellent example of that. George Martin's world building is silly and fun at points, and I think that having that included in House of the Dragon is something that I'm really excited to see, given the fact that it is something that I didn't really like in Game of Thrones, the fact that they went away from these more upbeat and colorful elements of the original books. The Song of Ice and Fire books are very maximalist in terms of their tone and aesthetics. We hear of a number of characters with fantastical armor and uh, clothing and all variety of just appearances and things like that. We have a number of silly names, too, we, like Dick and Tarly from the show, or uh, Uther Shit, who I believe comes up in the Sansa sample chapter for The Winds of Winter. Uh, we hear of a number of excellent examples of really interesting clothing as well, which is something we get a bit more of in House of the Dragon than we did in Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones was very muted and drab at times, whereas House of the Dragon has some pretty bright and ostentatious wardrobe. Roose Bolton in the books has a bright pink cloak that he wears all the time. Euron has an eye patch and magical armor and a magical horn and is 50 times better than his show counterpart. There's a cape made out of roses. There's a unicorn helmet. There are so many small details that really enhance this world and create such a bright and fantastical mental image for the reader. And I just love that, and I really hope it's adapted to screen more in House of the Dragon Season 2. And this is something that the first season of House of the Dragon has already improved upon a fair bit. There's so much heraldry and bright colors in any given scene, and that was a specific request of George R.R. R. Martin before this first season was made. Additionally, we have things like Damon's armor in the first episode and that we see again in the season two trailer that are just so kind of out there and cool looking. It does very much remind me of what I imagine Euron's armor to look like in the books, and it's very cool to see. I hope to see more of that design in the second season. And hey, if you're enjoying this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe if you are a Muppet Tully supporter, because this is going to be your main hub for Muppet Tully news going into Season 2 of House of the Dragon. Back to the topic of Muppet Tullys, the first of these lords is Grover, who I already touched upon a bit earlier. He is the lord at the beginning of House of the Dragon, and he remains the lord at the end of the first season of House of the Dragon. We know he is quite old, even at the beginning of the show, so he is probably quite ancient by the time that the war comes around. 
The one instance we hear is him asking the crown for aid with this conflict that I mentioned earlier, and we do hear in Fire and Blood a little bit more about what he's done in the past. Specifically, we hear that he supported Prince Viserys Targaryen instead of uh, Rhaenys Targaryen in the Great Council of 101 AC. He was very vocal about wanting a male claimant over a female. That might be something to keep in mind in terms of the future of House of the Dragon, given that the liege lord of the Riverlands is the Iron Throne, and it seems as though Aegon at present has all of those uh, elements about him, though it is worth noting that we hear from the uh, end of House of the Dragon Season 1 that Daemon is planning on taking Caraxes and going to the Riverlands and hopefully winning support for Rhaenyra's cause. So that does seem to make the Riverlands and the Tully support a bit of a toss-up, at least in the hands of Lord Grover. Sir Elmo Tully is the eldest grandson of Lord Grover Tully, with Elmo's father assumedly being Big Bird Tully. We don't know much about Elmo and House of the Dragon, but spoiler warning for the rest of Season 2 uh, going forward here, we do know that he is likely going to take control from Grover in terms of the Tully forces and actually being able to pledge their allegiance to anyone, given the fact that Grover is infirmed and on bed wet rest and not really able to do anything on his own. This creates a pretty interesting dynamic in the Riverlands, and that dynamic is only compounded by Lord Elmo's two sons. I know I did a little mini spoiler warning in the previous section, but this segment is going to have major spoilers for late game House of the Dragon, specifically probably seasons three and four. So if you don't want to spoil that, skip ahead to the next section. Kermit and Oscar are members of a group known as the Lads, which is A, the best named group in Westerosi history, and B, a group of young lords and knights who goes to serve Rhaenyra and ends up mopping up most of the Riverlands and the Stormlands at the end of the war. We hear of a number of battles in which they participate, specifically the Battle of the King's Road, and we hear that both Oscar and uh, Kermit are remarkably brave in battle. I am quite excited to see their dynamic in the show. We don't really know much about either of them as people in the book, and I think it could be very interesting to see both of these individuals, who at least in the annals of history are painted as good people, kind of bouncing off each other and seeing what that very uh, common in House of the Dragon second son dynamic is like in people that might be more morally upstanding than like the Targaryens, the Valerians, or the Hightowers. Kermit's name was also briefly put forward as a candidate for Hand of the King, which is really impressive considering his age, but that guy Unwin Peak unfortunately vetoed that suggestion, so another loss for Unwin. Overall, I'm very excited to see the Muppet Tullys brought to life in Season 2 of House of the Dragon. I think they're going to be fascinating to see on screen, and I do hope they are played by actual Muppets, but barring that, I am very excited to see the actors and how they pull off these fairly interesting family dynamics and these uh, brighter elements of the show that might not exist in terms of uh, the relation to the main series, Game of Thrones. Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this, be sure to leave a like and subscribe. I really appreciate it, and it does really help me grow the channel. I'm going to have a ton more House of the Dragon content coming for Season 2, in addition to my regular Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones stuff. Uh, this was a very fun video to make. I love the Muppet Tullys, and I'm very excited to see them in Season 2. Unlike some people who I won't name that are named Fantasy Haven, uh, be sure to check his channel out as well. Uh, his videos are great, and uh, even if you're bullying him in the comments about Muppet Tullys, be nice. Uh, I will have more videos for you in the near future. I try to do a video every week on A Song of Ice and Fire or Game of Thrones. And I look forward to seeing you all hopefully at the next one. Thank you again for watching and have a great rest of whatever time it is when you're watching this. You can watch this at any time. It's the wonder of the internet. I'm rambling. Goodbye, people.